Sorry, that's just me. I'm just trying to, I'm just checking if this works or not before we get. Okay, we'll let that run now.
Well, folks, good morning and uh, a really warm welcome uh, here to Burkhead Free Church this morning. Uh, my name's Peter. I'm the minister here. And uh, it's great to have you with us, whether you're a regular part of our church family or whether you've just stumbled across this online um, or if you're with us for the first time, welcome. At some point, you might like to head on over to burkheadfreechurch.org forward slash Sunday service. And there you can find a service sheet. Now, you might like to have that to guide you through this service. There's space to take notes in our sermon. There's follow-up questions. There's, there's all sorts of things like that. Uh, but perhaps more importantly for the week ahead, it will show you everything that's happening and give you uh, access codes for some of our online meetings. Uh, today we are continuing our series in the book of First Kings. I'm really pleased to say we have uh, David Meredith preaching for us. David is the, uh, the mission director of the Free Church. He'll be joining us later from Edinburgh. Uh, tonight uh, we are continuing our evening services which started at the end of January. Uh, it's great to be meeting morning and evening and we'll be continuing our series looking at Christian doctrine. That's at 6 p.m. tonight. And then we have a time of fellowship on Zoom after that at 7 p.m. Uh, tomorrow morning, we meet to pray for our mission and vision. That's at 10 a.m. Tuesday at 7 p.m., we have our Pathfinders Youth Group, again on Zoom. And then on Wednesday, we meet uh, to pray together as a church family, again uh, on Zoom. And you can get all the access codes, as I said, um, on the sheet for that. Uh, next weekend, next Saturday, uh, we're having 24 hours of prayer. Um, this is a chance to sign up uh, to pray uh, on your own uh, for one or more of those hours so that between us as a church, we have a full 24 hours of prayer. And one of the things we'll be praying for uh, is our invitation service, which happens on Sunday the 7th of March, uh, the week after. And uh, you'll hear more about that soon as well. If you are new with us today, you're here for the first time, again, welcome. It's great to have you with us. And at some point, you might like to go to burkheadfreechurch.org forward slash new. There you'll find lots of information about our church, who we are, what we do, how we're helping during this COVID pandemic in our community, and maybe most of all, uh, about the Christian faith. So head there at some point if you'd like. As we begin, just listen to these words from the book of 1 Timothy. They explain the gospel and then they call us to worship the God of the gospel. Uh, Paul, who wrote it, says this. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. He goes on to say, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. We give honor and glory to God as we meet today. That is our primary reason for meeting. And we're going to begin to do that in song. This song is a great old hymn. It's a prayer that God would be our vision, that he would fill our vision, that he would give us his wisdom. So let's worship him together as we sing. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my 
riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, thou and always. Thou and thou only, the first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure. It's good to worship God together, and it's good to have the children with us as well. Children, welcome. I hope you're watching at home. Uh, Later on, there'll be another Sunday School video posted for you online by Abby. I hope you're enjoying those. Uh, But just now, something from me for you. We're thinking about weakness and strength and what God has to say about all of that. So here it is. Right, let's see how we do this. Google Classroom, uh, log in, oh no, first I've got to log out, log out, uh, what are the tasks for this week, oh, home school, home learning, ah, right, okay, here it is, spelling, okay, I can do that, right, what have I got to spell, cat, oh, Okay, I can do that. Let's have a look now. Curly K and an A and a T. Cat. Fantastic. I'm going to get top marks here. What next? Uh, Oh, bed. Okay. Let's do a B and an E and a D. Fantastic. What's next? Discombobulate. Uh, you know, I can't do that. All right, what else have we got here? Swimming? Is that even allowed? I can't swim very well. What else now? Uh, PE, okay, what's this? Weightlifting? I wonder, boys and girls, are you strong or are you weak at spelling? If you can spell discombobulate, we'd probably say you were strong at spelling. I wonder, boys and girls, are you strong or are you weak at swimming? I'm a pretty weak swimmer, I have to say. I wonder, boys and girls, when it comes to your muscles, are you strong or are you weak? Now, I reckon most of us like the idea of being strong. We don't much like the thought of being weak. 
But, you know, here's something strange that it says in the Bible. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians says this. Let me just get it up here. He says, The Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient. That means enough for you. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. That's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses. That's a strange thing to say, isn't it? But do you know, boys and girls, the gospel, the message about Jesus, is all about us being weak. We couldn't rescue ourselves. We weren't good enough or strong enough to do that. No, Jesus had to come. And so when we want to share the good news of Jesus with other people, we don't have to be strong to do that. In fact, Paul says he's glad he's weak because then he shares the good news of Jesus. And people don't go around thinking how great Paul is or how strong Paul is. No, they think how great God is and how strong God is. So just remember, whether you think you're strong or weak, really, we're all weak in lots of ways. But God can still use us. Well, fantastic. We're going to have our Bible reading now. And uh, so you might like to find, uh, if you have a Bible, 1 Kings chapter 10. And uh, of course, if you don't, the words will be on the screen as well. So here's our Bible reading. 1 Kings chapter 10. When the Queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon and his relationship to the Lord, she came to test Solomon with hard questions. Arriving at Jerusalem with a very great caravan, with camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold and precious stones, she came to Solomon and talked with him about all that she had on her mind. Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain to her. When the Queen of Sheba saw the wisdom of Solomon and the palace he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his officials, the attending servants in their robes, his cupbearers and the burnt offerings he had made at the temple of the Lord, she was overwhelmed. She said to the king, The report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. But I did not believe these things until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told me. In wisdom and wealth you have far exceeded the reports I heard. How happy your people must be. How happy your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Praise be to the Lord your God, who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel. Because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel, he has made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. And she gave the king 120 talents of gold, large quantities of spices and precious stones. Never again were so many spices brought in as those the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Hiram ships brought gold from Ophir, and from there they brought great cargoes of almug wood and precious stones. The king used the almug wood to make supports for the temple of the Lord and for the royal palace and to make harps and lyres for the musicians. So much almug wood had never been imported or seen since that day. King Solomon gave the Queen of Sheba all she desired and asked for, besides what he had given her out of his royal bounty. Then she left and returned with her retinue to her own country. Well, thanks so much for reading for us. And uh, now we're going to come to uh, perhaps our, our greatest privilege as a church. Uh, we've heard God speak to us through his word. The amazing truth is that he invites us to speak to him as his children to our Father in prayer. So let's pray together as I lead us. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Naught be all else to me, save that thou art. Father, as we gather today, that is the cry of our hearts, that you would fill our vision. That we would sing and speak and live wholeheartedly for you. And yet, Lord, as we reflect on our lives 
even this day and this past week. We see all the ways that other things have filled our vision. We see that we've looked for wisdom from other sources. We've run after other gods that are no gods at all. And so we come to you today confessing that sin. Confessing our need again to know your forgiving power. How we thank you that the Lord Jesus went to the cross for us. We look to him and to his blood shed for us for forgiveness and cleansing and renewal. And we thank you for the precious promise of your word that says those who confess their sin will find you to be faithful and just, to forgive and to purify. Lord, we live in a world surrounded by many needs on every side. We bring to you today those known to us, perhaps in our families or our friends and those in our church family who are in great need of your help and blessing. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling with sickness, living in the shadow of death. Lord, comfort them, we would pray. Give them a real sense of your nearness, of your presence. Lord, we pray that you would meet the needs of all who struggle and suffer. And we pray most of all that our eyes might be filled with a great vision of Jesus who doesn't lose a single sheep from his flock, who keeps his people safe until the end. Lord, we pray that you'd give us a deeper sense of trust in Jesus and in all he's done for us, all he's won for us. Lord, as we think of physical health, we want to pray to you for spiritual health. This year has reminded us, if nothing else, of the shadow of death and how it hangs over our lives. And Lord, we see how precious and how needed the gospel is. Lord, we pray that you might help us in our efforts to make Jesus known. We pray for our invitation service in a couple of weeks' time. Lord, that you would make us ready and willing and bold in inviting our friends and family and neighbours. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to make the very most of this opportunity when many people can look in on this service from the comfort of home. Lord, we pray for our church through that initiative and for other churches too that you would equip us, that the gospel would go out in these days, that people would come to Jesus and find forgiveness and new life in him. Lord, we pray for our children as some of them begin to go back to school uh, this coming week. Lord, we pray that you would bless them with a smooth transition. We pray too for teachers in schools, for our own primary school here in Burkhead. Lord, that you would bless and help the staff with all the change that they've had to cope with. Lord, we continue to pray for all the children that we have contact with as a church. Much of it's severed in these last months. But nonetheless, we continue to pray that through our Sunday school, through our clubs when they restart, through our relationships with families, many families and children would be drawn to know Jesus for themselves. Finally, Lord, we pray for David now as he comes to bring your word to us. Lord, may he preach it faithfully. May you give us ears to hear what you're saying through your word and in the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I am going to hand over now uh, to David Meredith. David is the, the mission director of the Free Church of Scotland. He's down in Edinburgh, uh, but he is going to be bringing us today's uh, sermon on 1 Kings chapter 10. So, David, over to you. Good morning, Burghead. It's good to see you. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is David Meredith. I work as the Mission Director for the Free Church of Scotland. We work also under the brand of Generation, taking the Gospel to this generation and hopefully in future. 
Uh, great to be here in Burghead in virtual form. I usually have an annual visit uh, up there to the Murray Coast, and it's great always to go there. Uh, but today we are reduced, as it were, to a virtual form. So Peter and some others have been going through First Kings with you. Uh, if you open your Bibles or open up your phones or whatever and have a look this morning at First Kings chapter 10. Now, the, the lifestyles of the rich and famous have always generated interest. Some of the most popular magazines are Hello Magazine or, or OK, where we ogle from afar the lifestyle of the rich and famous. The younger generation are intrigued by the Kardashians and their goings-on and how they live, their opulent lifestyle. Some of us looked at uh, with an inside view, didn't we, last week of Princess Anne's sitting room. Uh, that shabby, chic room in uh, Gadcombe Park, as there she was displaying her life for everyone to see. The rich and famous do intrigue us. 50,000 people go to Buckingham Palace every year by invitation. That is a non-COVID year. Another 430,000 pay to get shown around Buckingham Palace. And one of the reasons is that they, they want to see the treasures. They want to see how the Queen of the United Kingdom lives, what her lifestyle reveals about her. And Buckingham Palace is quite a place. Uh, I was reading that quote, the state rooms are lavishly furnished with some of the greatest treasures from the royal collection. Uh, I read here, there are paintings by Rembrandt, Rubens, Vermeer, Poussin, Canaletto and Claude. There's sculpture by Canova and Chantre, exquisite example of Servais porcelain and some of the finest English and French furniture in the whole world. We get that feel, don't we, in First Kings chapter 10. This is a um, celebrity, isn't it? Uh, at a whole new level. As the Queen of Sheba, no mean monarch in her own right, visits the renowned uh, King Solomon, who is known for his wisdom and known also for his riches. Now, the visit of the Queen of Sheba to King Solomon is, is surrounded by uh, so much mythology and mystery. But uh, most of that is really mere speculation. It is more Hollywood than reality. The Queen of Sheba. We're not really sure where Sheba was. Probably uh, tradition suggests somewhere in Africa, perhaps modern-day Yemen, perhaps, or, or more likely, the Arabian Peninsula. We know that it was a long way. She, she travelled many weeks to get there up to Jerusalem to have this encounter, this conversation with King Solomon. So, if you read this story, and I would advise you this Sunday afternoon in a lovely Burghead sunshine, that, that you sit down and just read again the story in 1 Kings chapter 10. It's a, it's a great story. It's got all the ingredients that we would want in a story. There, there's tension. Is Solomon as amazing as the reports had suggested? Is all that was said about him really true, or will there be a disappointment when the Queen gets there? So there's that uh, tension. There's also interesting detail, as we're told, in some uh, specific, uh, specific ways uh, about the riches of King Solomon. And, of course, verse 7, there, there's a turning point as the Queen of Sheba says, Wow, the half was not yet revealed to me. And of course, there's an outcome. She goes back to Sheba, laden not only with gifts, but with a story and no doubt many things to ponder and think about in her heart. So this was a meeting of two very wealthy individuals. Look, look at verse 2. It says there what she came with, her gifts, camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold and precious stones. This wasn't a bottle of Prosecco and, uh, you know, a box of After Eights from Tesco. Uh, this was a serious gift from one minor monarch to the greatest monarch of the day. Uh, and also, uh, it wasn't a, a diplomatic mission. It, it was more than that. 
The burden of the visit was that the Queen of Sheba wanted to know stuff. She, this was a, a quest knowledge. She wanted to have an intellectual engagement with King Solomon. She had many questions in her heart. And Solomon was known as a wise man. And so she wanted the, these, answer, these questions to, to be answered. So there, there was this curious attraction to wisdom. And, and right away there's an application. We know that you know, Solomon's wisdom came from God. There is a, a curious attraction to the word of God. And, and of the word of God, it's, it's compelling. It's intriguing. It, it, it says things that really are, are curious. Uh, and the curiously minded want to explore it. Uh, you may have just tuned in here. Maybe it's some random event that's brought you here, or maybe you're just flicking through YouTube and you came on Burghead Free Church. But I would urge you also to be to be curious and, and to begin to delve into the wisdom that we find in the Bible and in the whole Christian story. And so you see that, don't you? Verse 1, she came to test Solomon. Look at the word there, with hard questions. Uh, look at verse 6. She said, your wisdom is true. Look at verse 7. The, the belief word is used there. Uh, I did not believe these things until I came and saw with my own eyes. So there's a faith thing there. There's a spiritual quest that's not just common to the Queen of Sheba, but I think that is common to every single one of us. So she is a complete outsider. But notice verse 9. Verse 9 says that she knew that Solomon was a worshipper of, of God. She even uses kind of spiritual language. Praise be to the Lord your God. She sees that Israel, that the nation uh, who have Solomon as their king, has got a special relationship with God. And so what we find here, and you know, as Peter and others have been saying, First and Second Kings is not just to be seen in its own right. It's part of a, a bigger book, not the, just the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi, but it's part of the whole Bible. It's just one story and a big story that stretches from Genesis to Revelation. And the hero here in chapter 10 is not Solomon. Uh, is not the Queen of Sheba. Matthew chapter 12, verse 42 is, is critical to understanding this passage because it says that someone or something greater than Solomon is here. So here, tucked away in 1 Kings chapter 10, we've got a, a little, more than a hint, I think, of, of a greater king, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we see that he essentially is the hero of First Kings chapter 10. Yeah, First Kings, as Peter has said again and again, it's about David, it's about Solomon, it's about the, the downfall of the kings leading to exile. It's about the old triumvirate of money, sex and power, isn't it? We've seen all these things and you will see all these things in the coming chapter. But it's speaking more than that. It's speaking of a kingdom, not the kingdom of Israel, but it's speaking of, of the kingdom of God, how these kings may come and they may go, but they point towards a greater kingdom, a more enduring kingdom. And surely in these strange days in which we live, we are also looking for a greater and a more enduring kingdom. So let's look at the passage together, wherever you are in your, in your house in Burkhead or, or wherever uh, in the UK or in the world. Just draw aside and let's open up First Kings chapter 10. And I want us to notice three things about wisdom. The first thing we notice here is the fact of wisdom. Wisdom's a thing. Uh, look, look at uh, verse 4. We've got that phrase, don't we? Uh, the wisdom of Solomon. It's a, one of those expressions that's even in our own vocabulary. Folk today will still speak of the wisdom of Solomon. And, and, and there's hints to what you know, the, both the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon understand as wisdom. Verse 4, it leads to a, a healthy kingdom. It's a wisdom. It covers all elements of life. 
They talk about architecture, they talk about politics, they talk about faith, they talk about religion. Look at verse 5, and the burnt offerings he made at the temple of the Lord. When he saw all these things, she was overwhelmed. And so wisdom is a thing, and it's not just a a kind of abstract idea, It, it gives insights and it's useful. We've seen here it's useful, as I said, for architecture, politics, spirituality, all these things. Wisdom has got an application. Isn't there the the famous expression or famous story? The difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. So you've got the idea there that, that wisdom is, is knowledge, but it's, it's applied, it, it's set to work. It's not a high IQ, but it's a wisdom, especially in the Old Testament, is a concern for, for reality. The way things are, the, 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 the meaning behind everything. Folk used to talk about a meta-narrative, the, the, the one big idea that drives everything, the, the one big idea uh, through which or, or around which everything else coheres. That's what wisdom is here. It's practical, it's real, and it's a basis for living. Now, <laughs> there's a deal for you. So what we're talking about here is the big idea. What we're talking about here in first. Kings chapter 10 is that which propels knowledge, spirituality. It really is the one big thing or idea behind absolutely everything. That is a huge claim. But that's the claim that we find here, and that's what Queen of Sheba is looking for. In a word, she's looking for the meaning of life. Are you looking for the meaning of life? However you've come here, whether you are a Christian or not, you are either looking for or pursuing further uh, the meaning of life. So it's not a high IQ. That's not what wisdom is. There are folk who don't have a very high IQ and yet they get it. There's others who've got a really smart intelligence quotient, but they just don't see it. They just don't get spiritual reality. So wisdom is really how we go through life, how we, the, the, the lens through which, the context through which we see everything. And notice this has a practical outcome. Look at verse 8. She says there, how happy your officials must be. So this wisdom, this coherent lifestyle, the meaning of life, and we'll see later that's really finding the reality of God and Christ. That the meaning of life has actually brought happiness. Do you know that uh, there is a kind of happiness index? It's a thing, believe it or not. Uh, each year, the United Nations, the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, draw up a kind of happiness report, world happiness report. I think this year the, the Norwegians got the happiest people in, in the world. Uh, we, we want to be happy people. I, I don't know uh, are folk in, in Burghead more happy than the folk in Lossiemouth or more happy than the folk in, in Findhorn. I, I don't know. What is happiness? Well, here we see that the Queen of Sheba is, is looking for, for happiness, or at least she finds it. That's part of the Christian story. It's more complex than that, of course. We don't have happiness all the day. We don't live in a world where everything's perfect. But the pursuit of God leads to this coherent worldview. It leads to seeing everything in context. And that brings a degree of happiness. And what is wisdom? Well, if you look in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 1 to Proverbs chapter 7, there used to be quite a well-known phrase, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of of wisdom. And so the argument here, the, the thesis that we want you to consider is that wisdom begins with the respect and awe of God. 
And indeed, more than that, if you read Proverbs, and again, do this someday, Proverbs 1 to chapters 1 to 7, wisdom is not a thing, but wisdom is a person. And we know through the Bible that that person is Jesus. You find parallels in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. The, the fancy word is Logos. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so what we find here is the remarkable claim that wisdom is not a thing. Wisdom is not an idea, but ultimately wisdom is a person, and that person is Jesus. And the bold claim of Christianity is not that there's a force overruling the world, but that there is one person, Jesus Christ, and he is the word, the fact of wisdom. There is wisdom out there, and that wisdom is found ultimately in Jesus. That's a really bold claim. So that's the fact of wisdom. But the second thing that I find intriguing here is not just the fact of wisdom, but the attraction of wisdom. It's so attractive that people actually seek it. Now, she had heard about it, not just his wisdom, but again, look at verse 2. She'd heard about the fame of Solomon and his relationship to the Lord. Now, notice in this passage how often the wisdom of Solomon is related or connected to his relationship to God. You see that in verse 1. You see it in verse 5. You see it twice, look at it, twice in verse 9. So, you know, what made her come from that journey from the ends of the earth was this attractive drawing power of what Solomon had and his relationship to God. Yeah, you know, she was rich. She gave the guy four tons of gold as a present. That's a substantial gift. She was rich, she was famous, she had influence, she had broken several glass ceilings, but there was this one thing in her life she just did not have. She had big questions. Look at verse 1 again. It says, she came to test Solomon with hard questions. I really like that expression, hard questions, because here, here's a confession. Here's me being absolutely straight. I sometimes think that many Christians avoid hard questions. I sometimes think that many Christians feel that it's impertinent if people come to, to them and ask really searching questions about why things are the way they are. Why does God allow evil in the world? Why do we have specific views on sexuality and gender? Why do we believe that this world is coming to an end? Why do we believe in the reality of the new heavens and the new earth? Why do we believe in the reality of a place called hell? Why do we believe in demons? Why do we believe in angels? Why do we believe in so many things? Did Jesus rise from the dead? We're going to be celebrating Easter in a few weeks' time. Is, is that pure mythology? Prove it. Now, these are hard questions. Uh, our faith encourages openness, that we face the big issues, and whatever big questions you have, they may be hard questions. Get in touch with Peter. Get in touch with the folk in Burghead, and, and don't be afraid to, to ask them. They wouldn't be offended. Uh, they, they'll sit down and maybe they won't even know the answer. And maybe their response is, great question. I'll have to think about that. But, you know, the older I, I get, and the more the world is complex, and, and we are living in complex days, are we not? There seems to be issues in the health, you know, the, the COVID pandemic. There's issues in the political sphere, you know, what's going to happen to, you know, Scotland and uh, England and Ireland and Wales, a constitutional question. There's economic questions. Will there be a huge recession? There are global questions, you know, is the world moving towards some sort of ecological crisis? But get this, as I read the Bible, the Bible story just makes sense. 
as I read the Bible and as I see the biblical explanation, explanation of the way things are, it all ties up and that strengthens my faith. So hard questions, verse 1, is good to come with hard questions. There, there was a hunger within the Queen of Sheba. And again, that's not a new thing. You find that, you know, people are always coming to Jesus with questions. There, there's no end to the questions that, that they have in, in their lives. They're just saying, Master, is this true? Is this true? What will happen? What? Why? Where? When? Question after question. And he sits down and he answers them. The late Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, I really found him such a fascinating character. He, he was a man of a different faith tradition to mine, but I always found him extremely um, suggestive and asking really great, poignant questions. In the Wall Street Journal, uh, October the 3rd, 2015, he, he said this, Homo sapien is a meaning-seeking animal. If there's one thing the great institutions of the modern world do not do, it is to provide meaning. We, more than anything else, are meaning-seeking animals. Your dog doesn't really seek meaning. It just lives for whatever dogs live for. Cats, a little bit more sophisticated, but even they don't really you know, search for the meaning of life. Even horses, sorry, Morik, even horses do not search for the meaning of life. But here is a woman who's homesick and she's attracted by a far off land. Does that register in your life? Does that kind of ring a little bell? You're homesick and you long for a far off land. You long for a reality which you know is there, but you've never quite found. You've heard in your own inner being of a state of mind or a relationship with, with, with God that, that you know exists and, and you've got that longing for it, that nostalgia for it, but you just can't get that resolved. This is what the... The story of the Queen of Sheba is all about. We've seen the reality of wisdom. We've seen the attraction of wisdom. But then thirdly, let's notice the source of wisdom. Well, in one way, it's simple. Verse 2, it's Jerusalem. <laughs> Jerusalem. So, you know, it was all there. The palace was there. The temple was there. The place of burnt offerings was there. The king was there, seated on his throne, on the throne of Israel. So do we just get on a plane when we're able? And do we go to a physical Jerusalem? Is there a modern day um, King Solomon? No, the physicality has changed. I wonder what the source of wisdom is. I think we see hints in the chapter. Again, uh, look at verse 2. It says there that they came uh, with hard questions, moving down to verse 5, and she saw all these things in Jerusalem and the palaces, cupbearers, and the burnt offerings. I think that gives it a hint. Burnt offerings... You look at the history of religion, you look at the history of faith in any tradition, and you'll always find offerings. You'll always find this idea of, it's called atonement. Um, what or who can, can, can relieve me of, of the burden of my sin? There's an old hymn, uh, who can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That expression, the blood of Jesus, it sounds kind of macabre, doesn't it? But it speaks there of, of a sacrifice. It speaks of the cross. We are just beginning the season of Lent. It's a great story, isn't it? The 40 days leading up to Easter. It's imprinted right there in the sensibilities of many folk with a, a UK Christian heritage, whether they've rejected that or not. But it goes on to tell the story of Good Friday, doesn't it? Where there was a sacrifice, not a burnt offering, but rather... Someone hanging on a cross, bearing the punishment that was due to us 
on his body. That's the source of wisdom. Wisdom is not simply an intellectual assent to what God says. Wisdom is having a faith in trusting that your sins have been laid upon Jesus and not upon you. Wisdom does not begin and end with Solomon. The claim of Christianity is that wisdom is resolved and seen in Jesus and primarily in Jesus as the offering. Not a burnt offering as in verse 5, but the offering of himself on the cross as a substitute, taking the sin that was due to, to us on his own body. Jesus said that. Matthew chapter 10, verse 42. Uh, Jesus said that, you know, the people, uh, the, the story is they're talking about uh, Jonah and they're using Jonah as a sign. Jesus says, yeah, Jonah, the story of Jonah was, was a sign of one who raised, was raised from the dead, just as, as Jonah came out of, of the ocean, so Jesus would be raised to dead, uh, from the, the dead. And then Jesus says to them, you look, after, you look for signs all the time. And he uses pretty strong language, you wicked and perverse generation, you look after signs. But something, he says, greater than Solomon is here. I am here. I am more amazing than Solomon ever was. And so you see similarities between Jesus and Solomon, but more than similarities, you see contrasts. Solomon's wisdom was amazing, but it was imperfect. He was just human. Uh, you only need to look at the next chapter. Look at chapter 11 and verse 1. If you like the word however, uh, you'll have a laugh there at verse uh, 1 in chapter 11. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonites, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them. Not only did Solomon intermarry with them, he intermarried to the max. He was a serial marrier. Solomon, unfortunately, and that was part of his downfall. Solomon had many wives. Jesus had one wife. Yeah, did you know that Jesus was married? Do you know that Jesus is married? His one wife is the church. The church is his bride. And so we see that contrast with restless Solomon, with his many wives, his harem, and Jesus, the faithful one, committed to us, the church. Solomon's heart, we read in 1 Kings, was turned away from God. Solomon was God. The glory of Solomon was in his wealth. The glory of Jesus is in his person. He had no wealth. Isn't that extraordinary? The most famous person in the whole of history had literally zero, no wealth at all. Yeah, they came from a distance. However, to give him gold as a child, whatever happened to that. But those who met him fell before him as God. So let's come, respond and come to this Jesus in faith. But then fourthly, and just very quickly, let's notice the response to wisdom. What are we going to do about all this? Is there a response? Well, you see the, the response of the Queen of Sheba. Verse 5, look at it. It says that she was breathless. Verse ver, ver, uh, 5 and 6. She was breathless. Uh, verse 9, she praised God. She, she was taken aback. Not only by what she saw, but by what she heard. And she told others there was a spontaneous overflow of, of wonder. That's why Christianity is unashamedly a proselytizing faith. As proselytizing sounds enormous you know, not very positive concept. 
Christianity is a sharing faith. Christianity is an enthusiastic, infectious, in the best sense of that word, faith. The Christians want, want to tell others that they've come, that they've seen. Like the Queen of Sheba came and she, her automatic response was to just tell that the half has not yet been told to me. God was glorified through this because she didn't just see the amazement of Solomon. She saw the amazement of Solomon's God. The response to wisdom. What about this morning? Is this just, just another talk? Just another video? Maybe some of you, you know, are, are serial sermon watchers. You've got some touring to do today already. You may go from Burghead to somewhere in the US. You may go to Australia. You may go down south to England. You'll, you'll check out lots of churches and lots of ideas. Some of you will maybe go to TED Talks or some other interesting thing, podcast or broadcast. But what's your response to this? What's your response to Peter and others' teachings through First Kings? What are we going to do with this. Kings, first and second kings is a tale of two kingdoms. The kings come and the kings go, but there is, as we said at the beginning, an eternal kingdom. Jesus, you know, in talking about Solomon said, the people of his generation wouldn't believe and they kept asking for a sign. The sign was always there. Jesus said, I am in front of you. I am speaking. I am performing miracles. I, you don't need a sign. I'm here. And Jesus was actually pretty serious there in Matthew 12. He said, the actions of the Queen of the South, that's the Queen of Sheba, will rise up against you in the day of judgment. So it's not a take it or leave it scenario. It's not a question of whatever, you know, fine, check this out. The material that we've been looking for today, it's options, but there's other options. There's a seriousness here because Jesus is saying to us through the words of Matthew, listen, I am here. I have spoken. There is going to be a judgment. Well, the queen ate at the table of Solomon, verse 4. The queen sat down and she dined with the greatest king of her age. I wonder, will we do that? Will we take that invitation? And will we come and will we dine with him, the king of kings and the lord of lords? There's an interesting passage. Um, you often get, get hints of, of what a book is all about. And as Peter would have told you, First and Second Kings is, is really just one book. And it's quite interesting. Right at the very end, of the very last story of Second Kings is fascinating. Because it's a story of how a king releases a captive and gives him a seat of honour. And he puts aside his prison clothes and he's allowed to eat at the king's table. You Look at that uh, you, yourself. Second Kings chapter 25, the guy is called Jehoiakim. There he was, the king released a captain, a captive, gave him a high seat of honour. That's the gospel, folks. The gospel is that through Jesus... Our, our captivity is over. He gives us new clothes. Like the Queen of Sheba, we are at the table with the King. May that be your experience today. And may we know and may we see that the whole earth is filled, not with the glory of a great king or a celebrity, but the glory of God. May we know his wisdom today and always. Amen. David, thank you so much for bringing us God's word. We're going to close our service in song. Here are a collection of verses from Psalm 90. Uh, they speak of God as the awesome one, 
who is to be feared and honoured, but who is also the source of true wisdom, the wisdom that we all seek. So let's sing together. Lord, you have ever been our dwelling place Before you made the world of time and space Before you made the mountains and the earth You are eternal, God, you gave them birth the power of your anger, who can know? Your us as great as is the fear we hold. Teach us to number all our days aright. So will our hearts be filled with wisdom's light. Return, O oh Lord, how long will you delay? Have mercy on your servants, Lord, we pray. Oh, satisfy us with your love always that we may sing rejoicing all our days and now we pray that grace mercy and peace from our God Father Son and Holy Spirit would rest upon you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Folks, thanks again for being with us today. Folks, once again, thanks for being with us this morning. It's really great you've joined us, whether you're in Burghead or nearby, or even somewhere else in Scotland or around the world. We're so pleased to have had you with us. Two reminders as we finish. Don't forget, if you are new, you're with us for the first time, Go to burkheadfreechurch.org forward slash new and there you'll see a place to sign up for a weekly message from us, a short video introduction and links to all kind of help that we're offering during the COVID crisis and a chance to explore the Christian faith further. And then if you've enjoyed and benefited from our service um, and you'd like to give to support our work, um, we'd love that. Um, I'm speaking, of course, primarily to our own church family, um, but even if you're somewhere else, and you've had some kind of benefit from the ministry that we're doing. Um, we offer it free and willingly to everyone. But if you'd like to give to support the ministry that goes on here, um, then you can go to burkheadfreechurch.org forward slash giving, and you'll see a page there which shows you um, how you can give and uh, what you're giving to uh, the work of Jesus here. Uh, folks, uh, good to see you. God bless. We'll see you again soon, I hope.